What's going on YouTube? We're back week 11 recap. As I said, there were some good games, some bad games from yesterday and Thursday and Friday as well. My bad to the Mac this week. Completely blew you guys off because I didn't realize you guys were playing Tuesday and then it's just a whole mess. But next week, full Mac will be predictions, recap, full everything. So we'll start on Thursday's game, which was Colorado State at Boise State. Uh, this game didn't start well or end well for Colorado State. They started the game with a blocked punt that went for a touchdown. And then right from there, it was kind of like, see you later. Colorado State was one for 15 on third down, so they weren't even able to move the ball at all. They did get their running game going at times, but <laughs> just wasn't enough. Hank Bachmeyer returned. Good thing because then they would still be working on the third string quarterback because their backup, Jack Sears, was still unavailable. Hank Bachmeyer, when he returned, he went 16 for 28, 202 yards, one touchdown. Nothing to really blow your mind about, but they're what you need to do. They won big, so it's whatever. On the other hand, on the other side, Colorado State's quarterback, Patrick O'Brien, was bad. And there wasn't nothing there was really nothing much to watch about him. He went nine for twenty. 140 yards, no touchdowns, and an interception. That is a losing recipe as Boise walks through this one 52 to 21. Next game is East Carolina at Cincinnati. Uh, it was on Friday night. This game was never close, as I figured. I figured this would be a done deal from the opening kickoff, and it pretty much were, was was that way. Although I will, there's a bunch of things I need to address about this game. It is a little weird that Cincinnati, you know, they 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 blew this team out, but the announcer at one point said if uh, if you don't if you don't believe in Cincinnati now or you didn't believe in Cincinnati, you should now. Well, why should they now? It was just a one-win team they beat. So I don't, I don't really understand that. So we had targeting calls come from East Carolina. I think there was two ejections as well. I, I've been hearing there could have been a third. I wasn't sure. I only caught towards the end of this game, the fourth quarter. I'm not sure exactly if East like East Carolina was playing necessarily dirty or they were taking unnecessary shots. Not too sure. We'll also talk about the fake punt that Cincinnati called in the fourth quarter with about eight minutes left when they were up by a bazillion. I mean, like a lot of people are complaining about it, but I mean, it is what it is. Like, it's not like it's a power five team playing a group of five team or a group of five team playing an FCS school. So I don't really see the huge deal. And also Cincinnati is trying to make a serious push for the playoffs. And if they're not going to, you know, look at them, they're going to make them look at them. So, I mean, it is what it is. And on the other end of it too, I mean, East Carolina could have some dignity and maybe stop them for once. Like, I'm not sure how many how many seconds were left, but on the like last play for Cincinnati offense, they literally handed the ball off and they literally just walked into the end zone. Like, you guys can also play some defense too, but that's just me. Then East Carolina's coach had like a minute talk after the game with the head coach of Cincinnati. I don't know what he was saying to him. Probably something along the lines of, you know, what the heck is your problem? I don't really know. I don't really see a problem. It's like you could have some dignity for your players too. Maybe tell them to stop or have them, you know, prepared for a beating, I guess. It is what it is. Cincinnati totaled in 653 yards, uh, despite 13 penalties that costed them 159 of those yards. Yikes. Clean that up a bit. I guess they get away with it because they were only playing East Carolina. Desmond Ritter is starting to evolve into something which is dangerous because when you match that with Cincinnati's defense, it's going to get pretty ugly for the other team. He went 24 for 31, 327 yards, three touchdowns, and he had eight carries for 75 yards and a touchdown. 
I mean, the one bright side, I guess, for for East Carolina was Keaton Mitchell, the running back. He had 17 carries for 124 yards and a touchdown. He's the only bright side. Uh, Cincinnati wins 55 to 17. By the way, they would only, they only had 17 points because Cincinnati had their backups in. UNLV at San Jose State. Both teams hit 50% on third down. Uh, San Jose State reached up to 500, 457 yards total offense, only 294 for UNLV. UNLV backup quarterback Justin Rogers ended up coming into the game. He went 12 for 18, 162 yards, a touchdown with no interceptions. Not sure if that was because of injury or it was just a benching. Either way, he played decent, but it, it just wasn't enough for San Jose to beat San Jose State because San Jose State's got a real good offense. Uh, Nick Starkle, quarterback for San Jose State, went 17 for 28, 274 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. Uh, Bailey Gaither had six receptions for 94 yards and two touchdowns and led the Spartans to another victory, 34 to 17. Next game is Florida Atlantic at Florida International. Florida Atlantic finally found a stride on offense. I mean, this was an offense that was struggling to get anything going. I think they, before this game, they only averaged about 15 points per game. And they didn't average that much yardage per game either. And they finally hit a stride here. No matter who it's against, it's a good thing because maybe they found a rhythm and found something that works for them. They had 461 total yards of offense. Florida International had 348 yards of offense. Florida International's uh, offense really wasn't that bad outside of you know third down conversions and whatnot, but they really weren't terrible. Florida International running back Devontae Price had 178 yards and a touchdown on 26 carries. And Florida Atlantic quarterback Javion Posey went 10 for 16, 80 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. He did turn the ball over and he threw for two touchdowns, but he also had 18 carries for 182 yards and a touchdown. And that's what really put Florida Atlantic over to win this game 38 to 19. Middle Tennessee State at Marshall. It took a second for Marshall to get really rolling in this. Another painful game for Middle Tennessee State. Marshall had 520 yards of offense and 35 plus minutes of time of possession. Asher O'Hara again did all he could for his team and no one just no one helps him. He went 29 for 44, 241 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions. So He's, he's throwing the ball fairly well. He didn't turn the ball over. He also had 11 carries for 39 yards and another touchdown. So he had two touchdowns, no turnovers. So, I mean, I don't know what more you want him to do. There isn't much more he can do. Grant Wells had a uh, pretty good day. He went 25 for 37, 336 yards, five touchdowns, and zero interceptions. And Marshall wide receiver Willie Johnson had eight receptions for 137 yards with two touchdowns. Marshall wins this game 42 to 14, and that is honor of the Big 75. If you don't know what the 75 is, go look it up, watch videos on it, do it. South Alabama at Louisiana. Strong outing for Louisiana here. 506 yards of offense. They did have 10 penalties for 94 yards. They definitely want to clean that up. Uh, two turnovers for each team. So another thing Louisiana should work to clean up. Uh, Levi Lewis went 21 for 31. 252 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Louisiana's rushing game really helped them in this. Combined, they had 37 carries for 254 yards and two touchdowns as Louisiana... Gets through fairly easy on this one, 38 to 10. Next game is Army at Tulane. Oh, my, I can't say what I want to say. Army, holy, I, Army went six for 17 on third downs. You know that's not good for triple option teams. They were out coached in every single phase of the game. Army had three turnovers. They tried ridiculous, dumb, fancy plays that couldn't really get anything mustered up. They started a quarterback that hasn't played in 
I don't know how long, and they touched something that wasn't broken, which was a, which was Ballard and Tyre Tyler playing quarterback and mixing it out. It was working. They were winning. The offense was moving. They looked better. They looked improved from what they started the year on. And the coaching staff was just kind of like, psych. We didn't see any of Ballard during this game. I don't know what the deal with Army was on that. Made no sense to start Christian Anderson here. Yeah, they opened up the playbook to a whole bunch of dumb, stupid plays. Sorry if I'm getting aggravated. They had The offensive line had pushed on Tulane for a good number of this game. The entire second quarter, they threw around Tulane. I don't know what... I don't know what the fancy stuff about was. It was like, there was a play, it was third and four. Army decided to throw the ball, and it was intercepted because, you know, this guy who hasn't played in how long decided to throw it into double coverage when one of his guys tripped. I mean, I, just a whole mess. Then an obvious fake punt was coming, and they faked it, and it was stopped because everyone in existence saw it. Probably even a blind person saw it coming. But it is what it is. Army, this was probably Arm Jeff Mongan's worst performance of his career, quite frankly. Especially, definitely at Army, um, at least. Shout out to Tulane. They played an excellent game. The game was close to the majority of the game until really the fourth quarter when Army just started doing all kinds of ridiculous things, like having their fullback throw passes. Yes, you heard that right. Their fullback throwing passes, not to mention the fullback they had throwing a pass. That was his first time being in the game, that entire game, not even to block or run the ball. Up. It is what it is. Tulane is definitely the better team. Um, Willie Fritz definitely has Jeff Monken's number. Probably will keep it that way. I don't I don't see, I don't know. Tulane wins 38-12. to SMU at Tulsa. Huge comeback for Tulsa here. This It was huge for their conference title game and their pitcher with no divisions. They might be the only ones that can withstand a Cincinnati defense and offense at this point. At the beginning of the game, it really, really looked like it was about to be a blowout. They, Tulsa started this game miserably. They had a pick six to start the game. Then they fumbled, and with a snap of your fingers, SMU was up 21-0. And with an offense like that, <laughs> you don't want to be down 21-0. But Tulsa got settled in. They got, you know, they, they, they got into striking distance and they went on a seven-play 65-yard drive to take the lead. SMU had, you know, one final shot at winning this thing, and they couldn't do it. Shane Bouchelle threw an interception to linebacker Zabin Collins, who was my player to watch. And he had a magnificent day, but we'll talk about that in one short moment. This will pretty much do it for SMU in the American Conference. They took that loss to Cincinnati. Now they take a loss to Tulsa. I really think it's going to be down to Cincinnati and Tulsa. Two slight things, obviously, to clean up for Tulsa. Definitely don't start the game as slow as you did with those turnovers, especially if you want a chance of beating Cincinnati. Cincinnati won't give up that lead like SMU did. I guarantee you it. Also, they had 13 penalties. That costed them 117 yards. That is also another thing to look at in the film room on what they were doing wrong there. Tulsa's quarterback, Zach Smith, went 26 for 38, 325 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Josh Johnson had eight receptions, 101 yards, and two touchdowns. And Tulsa linebacker, my player to watch, who I said needed to get in the face of this SMU offense. He did just that. Six total tackles, one sack, two tackles for loss, one quarterback hurry, and the game winning or clinching interception. Ulysses Bentley had 103 yards and a touchdown and 26 carries, and Tulsa gets the comeback victory 28-24. Next game is Georgia State at Appalachian State. This is exactly what Georgia State needed to, to avoid. They needed to make this game a shootout somehow. And I also said I don't. they needed to hit some big plays because I don't know how many drives they're going to be able to put on Appalachian State's defense. The answer, not much. Both offenses went for 300 yards. Appalachian State's went for 310. Georgia State hit exactly 300. 
No real offensive standouts in this game. Appalachian State defense alignment, Demetrius Taylor had seven total tackles, one and a half sacks, and three and a half tackles for loss. And Appalachian State gets a win at 17-13. Next game is Fresno State at Utah State. Utah State won the first quarter, and that is about all they can say. <laughs> Utah State continues to struggle on offense. They only had 12 first downs. They went 3 for 15 on third down. They did run the ball well, though. I think, I'm think i pretty sure they almost clocked in 200 yards. I think they were at about 199. Jason Shelley struggled again, 9 for 24, 144 yards. Utah State running back Jalen Warren had 9 carries for 136 yards and a touchdown, so positive note for him. Jake Hayner went 29 for 38, 422 yards, four touchdowns and one interception. And Fresno State running back Ronnie Rivers, who I said they'd give a heavy dose of, they did 25 carries for 132 yards and a touchdown. And also Jalen Cropper had 10 receptions for 202 yards and three touchdowns. Fresno State wins 35 to 16. Next game is UTEP at UTSA. This game wasn't close. UTEP only totaled in 246 yards of offense, while UTSA totaled in 600. Yeah. 29 first downs to 13 first downs. You already know who that's in favor of. Uh, UTSA Frank Har quarterback Frank Harris went 22 for 26, 312 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Definitely the best he's looked all year. And UTSA running back Brendan Brad Brady had 124 yards on 26 carries. UTSA wins 52 to 21. Next game, Southern Mississippi at Western Kentucky. This really can't feel good for Western Kentucky, man. You were playing a bad, bad, bad defense. You know, a, a defense that gives up 40 points a game and 440 yards a game. And you... <laughs> 304 yards and 10 points is all you have to speak on that bad defense. I a win is a win. They did. They they got the win. But Western Kentucky won 10 to 7. Next game is USF at Houston. Ouch! This game was definitely out of hand more than I thought it was going to be. Uh, Houston was definitely just the better team. They totaled in 505 yards of offense. USF did total win 359 yards themselves. Seemed like USF moved the ball pretty decently with 31 plus minutes of time in possession and only one less first down than Houston. Houston did hit a lot of big plays. That's probably really what, what did them in. They, they had a lot of drives where it was seven plays or less that they scored on. Clayton Toon went 14 for 25, 165 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. He also had 10 carries for 120 yards and two touchdowns and Houston Runs away with this one, 56-21. Next game was Texas State at Georgia Southern. Credit to Texas State. They fought hard in this. They just fell short. Texas State had three turnovers, and they only forced two turnovers for themselves. So that really could have been where they lost the game. Another place they definitely lost the game was time of possession. Georgia Southern owned it. 41 minutes and 19 seconds. Georgia Southern held the ball for Shy Wirtz had a magnificent day running the football. He ran for three touchdowns and I believe 120 yards. Shy Wirtz, Logan Wright, and Wesley Kennedy combined for 49 carries, 302 yards, and four touchdowns. Yes, they all three of them had a really good day. The final of this game was Georgia Southern 40, Texas State 38. Next game is Hawaii at San Diego State. San Diego State got off to a ripping hot start, started this game off 28-0, and they really never looked back. Hawaii went 3-for-17 on third down with 275 yards of offense. Each team had three turnovers. Greg Bell carried most of the load in this game, but my players players to watch were the Bells, uh, Greg and Chance Bell. They combined 28 carries for 207 yards and two touchdowns. Again, most of those statistics coming from Greg. And their other running back, Jordan Bird, also 
put in some work with seven carries, 61 yards, and a touchdown. San Diego State won 34-10. Next game is Nevada at New Mexico. Solid game. Both offenses played pretty solidly. Uh, 392 yards for Nevada, 352 yards for New Mexico. Uh, one turnover each. Carson Strong went 24 for 38, 336 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. I'm continuing to like what I'm seeing from Carson Strong. Also, his wide receiver, Romeo Dubes, five receptions, 172 yards, three touchdowns, which was good enough for 34.4 yards per catch. That's insane. New Mexico defensive end Joey Noble was a bright side from them. Ten total tackles, two sacks, two tackles for loss. Nevada gets the win 27-20. Next game is Temple at UCF. This wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to get. Temple's three turnovers certainly didn't really help them. Temple did control majority of this game time possession-wise. They had 37 minutes and 13 seconds compared to UCF's 22 minutes and 47 seconds. Dylan Gabriel did half of what I thought he was going to do. He went 12 for 22, 268 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. UCF running backs Otis Anderson and Greg McCray combined for 20 carries, 119 yards, and three touchdowns. And wide receiver Marlon Williams, of course, did his thing with four receptions, 102 yards, and two touchdowns. And UCF gets the win 38-13. That does it for week 11, which is insane. I mean, the amount of cancellations this week was crazy, but we should all expect, or should have expected at some point to have some kind of mass, you know, cancellation there. We are in the middle of a pandemic, but that is it for week 11. Monday night or Tuesday morning, you'll see a prediction video for the MAC conference because I did a quick look and I believe they play on Tuesday and Wednesday again. And then I'll definitely do a recap video for the MAC on Thursday. And also on Thursday, there will probably be a the weekend uh, predictions. And then of course, next Sunday will be another recap for week 12 and that's it. So. Hit the like button, subscribe, tell your friends about my channel, and see you on the next video.